Live from the Austin Convention Center in Austin, Texas, it's The Cube at Dell World 2014. Here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. Welcome back to Dell World, everybody. This is theCUBE. Stu and I have been here all day. We'll be going all day tomorrow. Alan Atkinson is here. He's the Vice President and General Manager of Dell Storage. Alan, it's great to see you again. Thanks for coming on. Dave, always great to see you. Stu, always great to see you. So, you guys, a bunch of announcements today we're going to get into, but I wanted to first, I'm asking everybody, life is a private company. We've got Michael coming on tomorrow. He's been very vocal about that. Uh, you've worked at public companies. You've had your own startups. Uh, what's it like to be private again? You know, for me, it's pressure test that argument. <laughs> um, you know, it's a degree of freedom, right? So, um, it, it's it's the beginning of November, I don't have to sit here and give you uh, earnings reports and data about how, how, how the quarter did. It gives us the freedom to make certain investments and long-term decisions to go do some strategic things that frankly, just are really difficult when you're, you're running a 90-day shot clock uh, with Wall Street. And so, uh, you know, from my perspective, it's been, it's been all positive, all upside. Um, and I'll tell you what, the company is really energized. I don't know if you're getting that vibe when you're you're talking with, with folks yeah, at Dell, but are. the energy's the energy's there. All right, so um, we talk about um, a number of things that you guys got going on. Uh, one in particular is the announcements that you guys made uh, today around all flash arrays. And what I wanted to ask you about is you you, you like some others, or you, you unlike some others, chose not to go out and buy an all-flash array company. There are some other examples of that, but certainly IBM bought TMS, EMC had to buy Extreme IO. You guys chose not to buy uh, a company, and you're an acquisitive company. We are. Why is that, and what does that say about the zillion all-flash array companies out there? <laughs> well, you know, I really can't speak for what other companies felt they needed to go do in the market, but you know, when we looked at our portfolio, we really felt like, you know, First of all, we have a fully virtualized infrastructure, so that's a huge advantage. We don't move bits and bytes around on physical disks. So it wasn't that big of a stretch for us. Now, to be totally honest, we did have to rewrite all of our tiering software, right? So it wasn't like we just said, hey, let's shove an SSD in there and see what happens. Mm -hmm. You know, we rewrote it all so that we could really take advantage of multiple tiers of flash. And you know, Dave, if you look at what we actually do inside of the box, we're actually using that tiering algorithms that, that made us so famous back in the, from the compellent days sure. on forward. Um, and obviously we're leveraging a, a single stack architecture now, which is which is exciting as we've brought the ecologic and compellent families together. Um, but that, that tiering algorithm is giving us an opportunity to um, use different types of flash that others can't use because we can control the rights. And so effectively what's happening is we're writing into a, to a right or a high right endurance type of flash, and then we aggregate the rights and push them down into a much lower cost, read intensive type of flash. Well, this is totally transparent to the end user, but it gives us a huge cost advantage. And then beyond that, once we do that again, because we have the IP for all the tiering, we can then push down the spinning disk very, very easily, and we do. So you're tiering at the flash layer as well as the cheapest and deepest spinning disk layer, Yep. but you're writing to the flash first, correct? Yep, that's correct, and, it, and if you look at sort of under the hood, um, you can obviously buy it in an all flash configuration or you can buy it in a hybrid configuration. It's, it's essentially just a multi-tier architecture, so if you were to buy a, um, a hybrid version, what you would end up with is two flavors of flash, plus a spinning flavor, probably a, a high capacity disk. So, the reason I'm asking about the right to first, we've done some work sort of modeling out the impact at scale, when you start to scale out on writing to flash first, and at smaller scales it's not as big a deal, but the, the resources that required to support an application when you scale out, if you have a write first, flash first architecture, are significantly less, so the performance goes through the roof. What have yeah. you seen there? Yeah, I mean, our performance numbers are, are, are really staggering. That, that box that we uh, we announced today at uh, $25,000 entry price, I mean, that box will scale up to close to 200,000 IOPS, which is pretty remarkable at that price point. Right. Um, you know, and obviously you can have more boxes and you can you can aggregate and get more IOPS, but, you know, if you look at it on a, 
on a cost per IOP basis, it's it's pretty attractive. Well, the interesting thing is too, is because I run around, I talk to a lot of customers. I, I must have talked to five or six hundred customers between you know April and June this year, just sort of round tables, talking a lot about Flash, and most of them were still, it was still early days for yep. Flash. Um, now they put Flash inside their existing array, sort of bolted on, if you will, but their their big concern was still cost. Yep. It sounds like you're attacking that head on. Yeah, ab absolutely right. We, we want to bring Flash to the masses, if you will. I mean, we uh, if, you, if you look at it, I think we've actually gotten to a point where um, certainly a year ago, six months ago, maybe even today, Flash is largely a performance-based conversation. But what I've discovered from talking to lots of customers is that's actually morphing. And it, you know, I, I look at it as analogous to where we were, you know, maybe maybe 10 or 12 years ago with flat screen TVs, right? There was a, a vendor that was pretty dominant in the TV space that made you know CRT based very nice TVs, and then a couple Korean manufacturers came in with much lower cost flat screens, and in the space of about 24 to 36 months, they had won the TV market. And you know, people didn't really need a flat screen TV, but they wanted it. And we're seeing the same thing with flash. People want flash, the only reason they don't buy it is cost, that's it. And if you can solve that problem, go buy your product. Even get it close, you would think, given the performance benefits, it's going to flip. A absolutely, but I think, I think we can do better than close. Yeah, now, be, now be, it, why? Because you can do data reduction, you know, right in the platform, or, or so. Or well, actually... I think you know, the, the data reduction is a good thing, and it helps. But but I think it's the ability to use multiple tiers and multiple types of flash, where we can use very inexpensive flash that doesn't have great write endurance cycles because we don't write hardly ever there. We write at a different layer of flash. We aggregate the writes and push them down. And, and the performance difference between those layers is, is essentially nil. So the architecture is fully virtualized, so you're gaining benefits there yep. from a efficiency standpoint. Your claim to fame, compellent claim to fame, maybe you guys created the whole tiering yep. you know, notion, so you save a lot there as well. And you are doing data reduction inside the platform as well, or no? Um, so today, uh, we're doing data reduction on all of our secondary data. Yeah, okay. Right? And that's about, you know, your, your mileage may vary, as is the case with, with data reduction technologies. And you're going to see us continue to iterate on that um, pretty rapidly as we go so, out. Okay, so that's another knob that you could turn, yep. which is which is futures. Um, what do you make of all the flash? I mean, it's great. But I don't mean to disparage the flash startups and the VC money that's going. It's wonderful because it's it's innovation. But I wonder if the flash vendors of today are going to be able to achieve escape velocity the same way that Compellent. And, and, and say 3PAR and even Isilon were able to achieve escape velocity and get to be public companies. Some of these companies will go public, but they, the virtualization guys did it during the downturn. You know, and then some, some got in there, like Phil Soren and David Scott, before yeah. the music stopped. They yeah. raised a ton of dough. And when the economy tanked, back to after the, the dot-com blow up, the big guys sort of sat in their hands and really didn't innovate and were waiting around and then they said, okay, we, we got to do virtualization. It seems like the large companies, I'll include yourself, have responded to Flash a lot more quick, quickly than they have to the virtualization trend. I wonder if you could comment on that. Well, well I think there's been some lessons learned, right? So, um, and to be fair, there have been acquisitions in the Flash space and some companies have reached escape velocity, if you will. Yeah, but not 2.5 billion, or 2 billion, no, or 1.8 billion, no, or 1.2 billion. You know, I'm, I, I'm not smart enough to know what happens when, as you said, the music ends, <laughs> but it seems to me that Flash is just becoming ubiquitous. And if, if I look at kind of what's going on with price curves and density curves and where I think we'll be in a year with just Flash technology, it just seems to me that it's going to be ubiquitous in, in, in all of the products. Now, some vendors are going to do it better than others. I think we do it particularly well, and, and I think you know our, our our market gains this year would indicate that's true. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you, you know, it's anybody's guess. But I will say it's a time game, and the time is drawing nigh. I know Stu's dying to talk about your Nutanix deal. Well, right? yeah, yeah, so uh, <laughs> thanks, uh, Alan. Glad uh, you know Dave only took the first 20 minutes of the interview. Yeah, yeah. But uh, you know, when I look at Dell, Dell is really in a unique position at this blurring of the line between the compute and the storage. When even at Dell World here, I walk and look around the show floor. Uh, you've got people that use Dell hardware like SolidFire and Scale Computing. You've got uh, you know various investments in OEMs like the Nutanix deal we want to talk about. Uh, you, you've got investments in Accenta. Um, can, can 
can you talk a little bit about really this kind of you know software defined storage, hyperconverged, whatever you want to call it, and, and how your team looks at kind of the you know build by partner uh, you know options? Yeah, I can probably go for the next 20 minutes at least on that yeah. too. So, you know, software defined storage is one of those things that's on everybody's the tip of the tongue, right? You know, you, you you can't talk to a customer without, hey, what do you think about this company or that company or what's your software defined storage strategy? And by the way, it's not very different in networking and it's not very different in infrastructure. Software defined is kind of, uh, you know, one of the hottest topics you get, you, you got to have a position on. Um, you know, we announced our, our, our Project Blue Thunder effort over the summer, which was really our umbrella label for what we were doing with Software Defined. And if you think about it, you know, we have the perfect platform for Software Defined, as we like to say, your path, our platform, which is PowerEdge. And we talked about a couple of variants of that today here at, here at Dell World with the FX2 coming out and some of the other platforms. In fact, you just mentioned it, a, a, lot, of, a lot of the biggest SDS providers out there actually are on Dell. Um, which is which is kind of an interesting statement. We're very proud of that. We want to. We have a very very healthy OEM business that um, you know we're very proud of, and we we design with that type of thing in mind. But you know, when you really think about okay, what is what is the value of software defined? Some people say cost. I mean, I've got to tell you, I'm not entirely convinced of that. But one of the things that it is is it's very workload specific. It's almost impossible to have a good software defined conversation without also having a workloads conversation. And as such, you're going to run the right stack for the right workload. So a good example of that would be Hadoop, right? I mean, you're probably not going to run Hadoop as a general purpose file system. You're going to run HDFS because you've got a big data analytics problem and you're going to run MapReduce, right? So that's one example. There's others, you mentioned Accento and sort of what they can do with their ZFS based technology and some of their other newer technologies. Nutanix being a great example of scale out. So our view is, that we've got to have a healthy partner ecosystem. Of course, that includes some of our premier partners such as VMware and Microsoft as well, right? And, and I think that doesn't mean being everything to everybody, but it does mean partnering with the best of breed folks so that we can offer an end to end power edge based solution that includes support, integration, and all of those things. In the case of the Nutanix partnership, this one is a very deep OEM partnership. It's one of the ones that's fully Dell branded, end to end. We don't have a ton of those. Um, the Dell XC series is in every way a Dell product powered by the Nutanix web scale software. And it's, it's a very tight partnership, so we're super excited about it. Um, you know, I think the, the Nutanix web scale um, software is, is one of the, the, the biggest plays I've seen in enterprise infrastructure in many, many years. I mean, they are very hot and for good reason. They really do solve a problem. Um, and of course, we're also going to be developing our own IP in the software-defined space. So you can expect us to have a, a hybrid, if you will, of you know, tight partnerships with premier vendors, as well as Dell-based IP, Dell IP-based solutions. And you know, it, it's all of the above because, as I said, it is workload-specific. Yeah, Alan, just to comment, I, I think you're right. It's applications and where it's at, and the problem we've had with infrastructure for as long as I've been in IT is. We started with an application, then we had to make some bespoke, bespoke hardware, and I had to have my IT staff spend, you know, tweaking dials and adjusting configurations to fit that application, as opposed to we want infrastructure that's built to support that application without having to do all of that extra work. Um, can, can, Alan, from our understanding, you were you know, instrumental in that OEM relationship with Nutanix, and from what I've heard, it was, it was really fast from making the decision, all the work that's been happening over the last couple of months. I hear the, the engineering teams uh, between Dell and Nutanix had a big party last night. Can you give us a little bit of insight, because out of all the solutions that were out there, Nutanix was one of the only ones that didn't use Dell hardware, so how did, how did that one come to fruition and how did that, that partnership happen? Um, so you said a bunch of things there, Steve. Yeah. So let, me, let me see if I can knock okay. down a couple yeah. of those, right? <laughs> so, um, first of all, you know, I, I'd like to think that we do things pretty rapidly at Dell these days. If you look at how many product introductions we've gotten out in the last 12 months and the, 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 the pace at which we've moved, I, I think it's safe to say, you know, we're we're, we're pretty motivated and uh, you know, as a private company, we're moving pretty fast. So that's the first one. The second one is, you know, we, we went out and, and we talked to lots of customers and we talked to lots of the Silicon Valley companies and, and honestly, Nutanix was just had a unique level of buzz around them. I mean, their, their pedigree from, from the early Silicon Valley to scale out data centers, their uh, buzz in the industry, their, their customer penetration, um, frankly made them the type of company we wanted to partner with. And then I'll also tell you, 
that the teams just had a very good synergy. And you know, I'll, I'll let the Nutanix folks speak for their side of it, but the, the Dell team and the Nutanix team really developed a, a really good symbiotic relationship. And you know, we're excited about you know, taking this forward. So you, so you did that deal, um, you and others, but you, you initiated <laughs> it, right? It was sort of something that you helped catalyze. Let's, let's put it that way. I, I, that, I think that's a fair way of putting it, Dave. Yeah. Okay, so now where does it sit inside the Dell organization? So it, it is in the storage group, right? So the relationships own in enterprise and in, in specifically in the storage group. But also tell you increasingly, you know, the lines get so blurry between compute, networking, and storage, you know, even internally with our products and the way we think about things and the way we develop things that I wouldn't read too much into that. Um, but, but it does live in the storage group from a product management point of view and how we bring out platforms and those sorts of and things. And it's sold through the Dell channels, correct? It's sold through the Dell channels and direct both. And direct, but, yep. but, but, but Nutanix does not sell the solution, or does it? Nutanix does sell their solution, yeah, right? right, right but, but so they're going to keep a Nutanix branded product right. out there. But the Dell product that includes Dell support, includes PowerEdge, includes the things that we think you know, most, most companies find attractive, um, you know, is, a, is a Dell product that can be bought any way you buy Dell products, which means channel or, or direct. Now, I want to also ask you about sort of the, you mentioned Ecologic before and Compellent. Those two worlds have come together. Can you talk about that? Where, where, where are you? I know you're at the single stack now, but how did that come about? Um, what does that look like now? Yeah, so, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to do in order to get more leverage, more wood behind the arrow, if you, if you would, was to get everyone in Dell Storage pulling in the same direction. So we wanted to finish integrating the acquisitions. I mean, Dell Storage is really a collection of five acquisitions. So, Compellent and Equalogic, perhaps the best known ones, but also RNA on the uh, PCIe attached uh, Flash, which is a really innovative, cool product. That's the Fluid Cache for SAM product now. Mm -hmm. um, Xanet, which is our Fluid FS, and uh, Oak Arena, which is our data reduction technology. Yep. And so the mission was really, let's bring them all together in a way where everybody's protected. If you're an Equalogic customer, you can use the combined stack. If you're a Compellent customer, you can use the combined stack. So we're not all the way there yet, but we are beginning to bring out the 4020 being the most recent example, new products that are based on a single architecture, the FC series in this case. And we have announced um, you know, very clearly that we're going to be providing common management between both existing Ecologic Compellent and the new products, as well as replication between all the products and common management. So everybody's investment is fully protected and uh, it should be nothing but upside for customers. So essentially, is that, so that's where your R&D really is, is the net integration, right? That's where you put a lot of your emphasis. Well, integration and acceleration, we've added a lot of new features, things like data reduction, things like um, improvements in, in our failover technology, things like huge performance increases, things like rewriting for Flash, right? So that we can support multiple tiers of Flash, and I could go on and on. I mean, our feature list is very rich, but you can do more features when you have more engineers working on the same thing, right? Right, right. So, Okay, but so it's but it's fair to say, Alan, that a, a big chunk of that of R and D was on integration. As yeah, you sure. say, you added some other pieces, and, and, and the integration and was also a lot of the leverage in the model, Dave. So yeah, so the reason I'm asking that is, as you've, I mean, early on, you had to bring in big assets. You had to swallow Equalogic and Compellent. That was not trivial. Um, will the R and D then naturally shift toward other innovations? Now, what can we expect there? No, you know, I don't never say never, right? But I, I think, for as far as I can see, we're going to keep the same or more, uh, in fact, we just opened up a new design center last year, uh, on the existing technology. Now, my caveat there is, as things like software defined become you know, even more ubiquitous, um, we definitely want to have our own IP there, and there's multiple ways to get there, right? So, um, I I'm, I'm certainly not going to say that we may not redirect some efforts into the software defined side, but kind of the way we're seeing the Dell IP version of software defined is, we want it to be fully integrated with our mainstream stack. So we think it makes sense to have the same folks working on that. Um, you know, I think the value for customers is really if you can buy a product, uh, a Dell storage product that comes in small, medium, large, or software only, that's got an awful lot of value. Right. Especially if you happen to have a really good market share in service. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, right. So, Okay, so that, that software only piece, can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? Can we expect you to sort of extract the the function out of the hardware and allow that to reside Well, I, I, I'm not there. announcing anything today, Dave, but you know, we're certainly thinking about 
you know, hey, what would a software encapsulation of our technology enable? Now, again, we're not announcing anything. That's not something I have today. First, you know, priority is let's get this fully integrated family out. Um, but, you know, as we think about the way things go forward, software defined is clearly a force to be reckoned with, and it's clearly an area where I think the Nutanix and XC series is a, is a pretty good existence proof. This is an area where we're going to play. Well, speaking more generically about the industry, I mean, we've seen for years that you take a, a disk drive that you could get from whomever for a buck, and we and the enterprises sell it for ten. Now, the reason we're able to sell it for ten is because there's all that function in the controller, which is software, right? Yeah. So the industry seems to be wanting to, to to extract that, and then of course charge for that. Yep, that's that's fine. It doesn't really. Does it change the economics? You said before, yeah, not really about the economics necessarily. I, I kind of agree with you. You're yeah, gonna, I, I think that's you, mostly hype, Dave. I mean, I, and I agree with that because uh, you, you got R and D, right? And you got to you got to pay for that yeah. somehow. You got innovation has to get paid for. I agree, it's mostly hype. <laughs> no, I mean at a macro level, I think there's cost pressure on the entire industry to you know get more competitive. And as densities improve and technology prices there's come down, that's happening cost anyway, right? In this industry, right? Yeah, I mean, when is that? for as long as the storage business has been <laughs> has been out there. <laughs> Yeah, so in the course of cloud, maybe there's this other little Yeah, little so you're going to continue to see an economic curve that's going to provide more IOPS and more capacity for the dollar. No question about that. So you, but is SDS going to be a driver to really move that down? I think it's going to be a driver to get much closer to the application and much more workload driven. That's what I think it's going to bring. Yeah, really, that workload driven piece and automating that the knowledge to be able to apply resources to given workloads and orchestrating that is, that's new. That's new. Now, what that does, I guess it is economic from this standpoint, is it, 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 it attacks the biggest problem in IT, which is the labor cost. Yeah. Right? Now that doesn't necessarily mean, you know, the industry revenues are going to drop, it won't. But what it does mean is that IT organizations will be able to spend money elsewhere. Do you buy that? Yeah, you know, I, I, I think so, but I, again, the data center is morphing so rapidly and mm. flash technologies are making things so much more dense that um, I think people are going to use this in ways that are pretty imaginative. I mean, I, I certainly, you know, given our server share, I'm very excited to make sure that we're a leader in this space. And, and I, I, I think things will get redeployed and maybe labor costs come down a bit just because you're going to have less physical footprint, data center maintenance is less, and some of those variables change around. But it's actually pretty complicated when I start ma managing, I don't know, five, six, seven workload specific stacks, you know, one for my big data problems, and I've got to put another one out there for my, uh, my my cheap and deep, and I put another one out there for object storage, and I put, I mean, because that, that is what we're talking about, right? Yeah, so, okay, so let me, let me because you're a former practitioner, so this is, you, you, <laughs> you speak from, you got street cred here. So that's interesting what you said. We might be just sort of shuffling the labor deck, right, maybe not so much on what some people call non-differentiated heavy lifting of hardware and configuration. Well, well, Dave, let me tell you the way we're thinking about it. And you know, again, this is, you know, I, I keep re you know, repeating that this is a very emerging area. So some of the stuff's maturing right before our eyes, right? right? If you look at what we talked about when we announced Blue Thunder was, you know, if you start with a common platform, right, and that platform is PowerEdge, you're already building in a common management infrastructure at the hardware level. Okay, so that's interesting to begin with because now I can buy the same hardware for all those storage stacks. Okay, that's new, Yeah. right? Second thing is, um, well, if I'm starting to build in sort of state-of-the-art orchestration technologies, I'm putting RESTful APIs in all these, I'm working with vendors, and most of the open source platforms already have this, some of the proprietary ones do and some of them don't. Right. But we start making them in a way that they can be instrumented in a common fashion that we can use tools like ASM or other things um, to, to leverage orchestration across them, you can make the problem better. In a, in a perfect world, you would have common infrastructure and you could mix and match those storage stacks as your workloads dictated, right? That would be perfect. We're certainly not there today. Right, and you could do that based on policy or based on whatever analytics yeah, you can sure. pull from the system. Yep. So you could take the, you could take the, can you take the humans in, in, in the future, will you be able to take the humans out of that, that provisioning equation? I, I think provisioning will get far, far more automated. Uh, I, I actually have little doubt about that. Right. Uh, if you look at you know, even our XC series that we just announced, you know, the, the Nutanix relationship, it's so easy to provision there. I mean, you can do it in minutes, right? It's, it's extremely easy. And so the ratio of person to, to box is very, very attractive. 
And I think you'll see those those type of things happen in a wider area, but I don't think they're storage specific, Dave. I think you've got to yeah, you've yeah, got to sure. instrument that together with the workload and Absolutely. with the hardware. Yeah, right? and so yeah, so I, I, I want to tap tap on your uh, practitioner experience from your days in the financial services industry. When you think about cloud, and forget about the whole security and governance and on on premises or off premises, just forget about that for a second. And I know that stuff exists and it's important from an economic standpoint. Do you feel like your customers will be able to replicate the cost structure of the big cloud guys? Well, okay, so somewhat of a loaded question. Who's cost structure? Because I, I don't think that the, the private guys are going to be able to get stuff as cheap as the public guys just because of a scale, right? Mm -hmm. But I do think that ultimately private cloud has economic advantages to off-prem. Okay. And so I, I think you'll probably see some combination of hybrid, I believe that. But when you look at at least all the cost studies that I've seen, and I don't claim to be uh, an exhaustive expert on this, you know, unless you're at a very small scale, when you factor in management costs, networking costs, and moving the data back and forth, and all the rest, it still ultimately ends up cheaper to do it as a, as a private cloud, or at least at least a hybrid, not entirely. Renting public. is more expensive than, than owning at some scale. There's some at cost some scale, of right? There. Yeah, and, and of course it's hard to figure out because there's all these artificial, I mean even with Amazon, it's hard to figure out what, what yeah. pricing looks like. You saw when Google you know, took a shot at Amazon and said, hey, they announced price cuts every you know, th three times before breakfast, but in reality, hardware prices have come down a lot faster. And you guys take advantage of that hardware price. I mean, you guys cutting hardware prices all the time. Yeah, I mean, look, I mean the industry's price curves only <laughs> go down for price performance capacity, right? It's an amazing it's, industry we it, live it's in. It's been that case. Right. Forever, right, right. So, uh, and that's a great thing for consumers. I mean, look at the amount of power you have on your mobile device these days. Right, right. Okay, okay. So, probably not be able to replicate the cost structure of the public cloud, but when you look at at a certain scale, the overall costs, and you fact then factor back in. I remember my proviso, security and governance, all of this stuff. You get close enough that the business case for on-premises cloud is going to be really compelling. You, you know, I think so, right? Um, you know, barring some other major movement, of course you've got to factor people into that equation because somebody's got to administer that cloud. And so I do think there's an issue of scale. If you're, as, if you're not at a certain scale, I think public cloud probably wins. Right, and well, and again, workload dependent, so. All right, Alan, we got to leave it there, I, but I'll give you the last word. Um, thinking about your storage business, I wonder if you could, you can't give us you know, gross margin by product, but if you could just talk generally as to how the business is doing, and then, you know, what are the takeaways for Dell World 2014? Um, great question, Faith, thank you. Um, so, I mean, look, our business is, uh, I, I am really excited about how well we've done. I think you, you heard in, in Michael's keynote, you know, number one worldwide in, in capacity now. I mean, so we've passed everybody, right? And a lot of that is, um, the, the movement towards software defined and people moving data in, in, internally to servers and big dense servers and watching that shift. But you know, we're gaining share across every measure you want to manage, you, you, you want to mention, right? You want to look at external, you want to look at price bands, we're gaining share. And that's, that's exciting, right? I think the, the strategy we have in place is resonating. Um, disrupting the economics of, of storage, I think, is a message that people get their heads around things like the flash announcement of 25K, that's not hard to understand. Um, so, very excited about that, and I think that excitement, if you're walking around here at Dell World to answer your second question, um, you know, this is my third Dell World, and I can tell you the excitement, the momentum, the morale at each one has just built and built and built. I mean, last year it was right after the go private, people were pretty happy about that. That was a, that was a tough battle, right, got that done. And this year, a year in, um, I don't know how many folks you've talked to here, but people are pumped. Yeah, yeah, people are pumped, no right? doubt. I, I, it's, I was here two years ago, and the, the mood here is, it was good then, but it's even, it's even greater here, so. I think so. Congratulations, Alan, I love talking to you, because like I said, you got practitioner chops, you're a seasoned exec, uh, and I think they put the right guy in the job, so congratulations on the success, and I know you're not done, we'll be watching. Thanks, right. Dave. Thanks very much. Stay. All right, keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back to wrap, day one. We're here live at Dell World. This is theCUBE, right back.